we come to the practice because we're looking for some wisdom in our lives. And we hear that by meditating the mind gets to calm down. And it gets calm and still. It see things <clears throat> it can see things more clearly. And then the question arises, what kind of wisdom are we looking for? And it's important to understand right off the bat that wisdom is not a matter of being smart or stupid. Rather, it comes from conviction. In the importance of your actions. It's as simple as that. And just applying that principle across the board. That's what turns conviction into wisdom. Because sometimes we believe in the importance of our actions, and sometimes we don't. We dither around. Sometimes we don't like to think that our actions are going to cause results, because we know that our actions have been unskillful. And there are other times we hope very sincerely that they will have results. And so we dither back and forth this way, and as a result, wisdom doesn't arise. Even as smart a person as Einstein once noted that if you look at the history of science, a lot of the major discoveries came from young scientists. And they tended to peter out as they got older. And he said it wasn't because they got more stupid as they got older. It was simply because as a young scientist you're not afraid to hang on to some line of questioning to see how far it goes. You have tenacity, whereas the older scientists see lots of potential lines of inquiry and they can never really settle on one or the other. Part of the problem, of course, being their, their sense of their impending death. They're afraid that if they latch onto something wrong, then they will have wasted their later years. Of course, if they don't latch onto anything at all, they do waste their later years. But the younger scientists are not afraid to latch onto something to see how far it goes. So it's that quality of conviction and tenacity that makes all the difference. There's a story in the canon of two brothers, Maha Pantaka and Jula Pantaka. The canon doesn't tell much about them, it's simply that they were brothers and they eventually both became arahants. But in the commentary you heard that Maha Pantaka was very intelligent, and he had a very dumb brother, Chula Pandaka. So dumb that he was embarrassed that Chula Pandaka was his brother. The stories vary, but in each case it's a matter of Chula Pandaka finally settling down with one meditation topic and really carrying through with it. And it was t his tenacity that got him through, and he finally figured things out. So as you approach this question of how to give rise to wisdom in your life, you can look either at the very basic wisdom teachings or the more refined ones, and you find that they're pretty much all of a piece. One of the Buddha's basic definitions of wisdom is knowing what tasks are really your business and which ones are not your business, and focusing on the ones that are your business and avoiding the ones that are not. It sounds simple and basic, and it is, but if you really carry through with it, you find that it can take you far. What 
are your tasks? Well, if you want to find true happiness, one of the tasks is to develop the path. That's what we're trying to do right here, give rise to a state of concentration. The mind could be giving rise to all kinds of other states as well, but you're going to choose. that These are the states that are really worth getting the mind into, and it may, se may seem fabricated and constructed, and sometimes you wonder how something constructed like this could be worthwhile. But the mind is used to constructing things, and as long as it has this habit, you might as well construct things and help take you further, because that's part of the genius of the path. You could be sitting here creating all kinds of narratives in your mind, all kinds of theories about yourself, the world around you. But where do those theories lead? If you have the idea of yourself as a bundle of needs that need to be met, that are going to pull you away from the path, you have to learn how to question those needs. Are they really needs? Or are they just ideas that you've stitched together out of impulses? This is a lot of what addiction is about. You have an impulse here and an impulse there, and the mind starts stitching together and says, oh, there's a message here that I really need X even though it may be something that's really unskillful, really unhealthy. And it tends to take on a life of its own, so that every time the impulse arises, you say, oh, that's a sign this big, massive need I have that's showing. In cases like that, you want to undo the the theory you have, undo the narrative, learn how to cut it up into little bits and pieces. I, each time an impulse comes, just see it as an impulse and watch it in and of itself. This is where one of the more abstract wisdom teachings come in. With it. The Buddha says the strength of discernment is knowledge of arising and passing away, which we tend to equate with one of the more advanced stages of the practice, but it doesn't have to be. You see an impulse arise, you see an impulse pass away, and that's it. And whether there's a need lurking behind it or not, don't ask that question. Just watch it as an event in the present moment, and you can begin to deconstruct your belief of this massive need. In that case, you're following the task of abandoning the cause of suffering. In other words, your tendency to create enemies in your mind. Ideas, urges, narratives that really go against your own best interest. To stitch together those needs is not your duty right now. It's not one of your tasks. So you learn to let it go, learn to deconstruct it. As for what is your task, you learn to stitch together moments of concentration. And again, to begin with, these may seem like just momentary blips on the screen. The mind settles down for a bit and whoops, there it's gone, off to someplace else. We want to learn how to appreciate those little blips. They're small and unassuming to begin with, but without them the mind would go crazy. Many people come to the meditation wondering, when is the mind going to settle down? The problem is it does settle down in little bits and pieces, but then we trash those little bits and pieces of concentration, those little bits and pieces of stillness. They don't seem impressive. They don't seem like anything we could rely on. So this is where the conviction comes in. And it's not a matter of being smart or dumb. It's simply a matter of holding on to that conviction that these are skillful mind states. And the task is set out. If you want to find a way to true happiness, you learn how to stitch these things together. 
So again, you focus on arising and passing away, but with a different purpose. When those moments of stillness come, you want to understand why. What did you do? When they go away, you want to understand what did you do. Not just watching them arising and passing away, but also having a, an agenda. Once you begin to notice patterns in the mind, you want to stitch them together. What can you do to give rise to these moments of stillness again and again and again? What can you do to keep them going once they're there? And John Lee once made the comment, there are three stages in the meditation. One is learning how to do it, the second is learning how to maintain it, and the third is learning how to put it to use. The doing is not all that hard. You focus on the breath. There you are. And then you go shooting past that, off in the other direction, to something else. And then you come shooting past it again. It's like a little kid running into the house, grabbing a sandwich, and running back out again. And then finding that he's dropped the sandwich as he's running along. What you want to do is to learn how to get a sense of balance there when you're with that moment of stillness. And this will take time. In the beginning you put a lot of energy into it and you wonder how on earth can you ever maintain it. But as it grows, it begins to, begins to give energy back to you. So it becomes a positive feedback loop in both senses of the term. In other words, the more you do it, the more energy you have, and the more energy you have, the more you can do it. And it's a good thing. So when you're thinking about developing wisdom in your practice, don't overlook the Buddha's basic wisdom teachings. Simple things like this comment that the difference between a wise person and a fool is that the wise person sees the need to train his or her mind. And what makes a person foolish is that that person doesn't see that need. And you've got lots of smart people out there in the world who don't see that need. Their training the mind is simply to train it how to think in different ways. What the Buddha is talking about in training the mind is learning how to develop good qualities, qualities like honesty. Persistence, tenacity, conviction, which are not a matter of being smart or stupid, but simply a matter of wanting sincerely to find long-term happiness. That's another one of his basic definitions of wisdom, is the question, what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? It's wise because you realize that long-term happiness is a lot better than the quick fix. And also in the sense that you realize it's going to depend on your actions. So the basic wisdom teachings are often the wisest. If you start getting off into advanced theory, it's very easy to get lost. And John Lee once made the comment that we tend to confuse things. That Teachings that seem basic and simple we don't think are deep. The deep teachings are the ones that are abstract and obscure. But a lot of times those abstract and obscure teachings are just words, which are not deep at all. The deep teachings are the ones that give us advice that's useful all the time, right here, right now. Because what use is wisdom if it can't lead to long-term happiness, if it can't stop you from causing yourself to suffer? And John Lee's image is of a person who wants to find gold. You know there's gold in the ore in the mountain, excuse me, gold in the rock in the mountain. And the person who thinks he's smart tends to say, well, all I have to do is just go out there and Take a little pick and get the gold out. I don't want to, I don't want the rock, I want just the gold. That would be stupid to take the rock. But you can't get gold out with a pick. 
In other words, you can't gain the Dharma by figuring things out too much in advance. It's the person who's convinced that there's gold here, and it may take time, and it may take work, but you're willing to put the effort into it. You're willing to use your tenacity. In other words, you take the rock, and you bring it home, and you throw it in the fire. And eventually you get to the point where the fire reaches the melting point for the gold, and the gold comes out on its own, without your having to figure it out. In other words, if you hold to a few basic principles and apply them across the board, this principle especially of knowing what's your task and what's not your task. If you know what your task is, you just stick with it. As for all the other work you could be doing, you can let it go. You don't have to waste your time. So as you sit here, get them getting the mind still. It's like taking the rock and subjecting it to heat. Just sit here and watch as, skill, as precisely as you can what's going on. If there are unskillful mental states that threaten to stitch themselves together, you learn how to cut, cut, cut all the connections. As for the skillful ones, you learn how to sew them together. That much right there is going to solve a lot of the problems in the mind.